one day she comes home from school. She's only like 10, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And there's these people beating up her dad. So mm -hmm. she's really scared of what's going on. And she looks into the farmhouse. And a man has got a shotgun trained to her mother's head in the kitchen mm -hmm. table. And she knew that she being the only bilingual one in the family, even though she was so young, she had to step in. Welcome to Wasabi Interviews, where we talk to interesting people in Japan, Hawaii, and beyond. And today, we are joined by a Soto Zen Buddhist priest and professor at the University of Southern California, Dr. Duncan Ryuken Williams. Welcome. Happy to join you today. Great. So, Dr. Williams is the author of a book that was published in 2019. It's called American Sutra. And that is how actually I, I found out about Dr. Williams through through that book. It's a very, very interesting book uh, that focuses on the Japanese American Buddhist experience during World War II. And we will be talking about that book because there's so much to discuss. But first, I wanted to ask a, a little bit of a random question. Um, so as I was doing some research and reading about you, I read that in 2015, you uh, hosted uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan uh, at the University of Southern California. And I was just curious from like a logistics perspective, what is it like when a prime minister like visits the university? Is it my, my you know, I, I can't help but think it's something like guys in suits going around and, you know, kind of secret service sort of thing. What was it like for, for you? Like, I guess you were part of the, um, you know, organizing all that. Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, I'm at USC. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm a professor in the religion department, but I'm also the director of the Center for Japanese Religions and Culture, which is the kind of Japanese studies center here on the campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that capacity, uh, I was asked by the then president um, uh, and his wife to join them in greeting uh, Prime Minister Abe and his wife when they came mm -hmm. to visit the campus. They had just done a formal state dinner in Washington, D.C. at the White House. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then on the way back, they had spent a night uh, in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Abe, back in 1970, uh, one, two, three, like in that uh, early 70s, mm -hmm. had spent... Uh, a few years at the University of Southern California as a student. Mm -hmm. And so when I had learned from uh, the consulate that he was going to be in LA and he mm -hmm. wanted to pay a visit to the campus, yeah. um, I was charged with kind of making those arrangements. And so, um, yes, there were secret service people on the U.S. <laughs> side. They were Japanese uh -huh. uh, secret service people. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, when he came to visit my center and I gave a presentation about it and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of protocols about uh, who could, you know, receive a certain kind of clearance to uh, be how many feet away from the panel. There's many different things wow. that go into uh, everything from who gets to be in a photo op with him, who who can be walking beside him uh, mm -hmm. how, at how many feet and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of protocol that goes into hosting a prime minister. And I remember that day mm -hmm. uh, we had to kind of like take a certain number of blocks away from my center and the president's office to, I guess, uh, secure, you know, like secure it as it mm -hmm. were. And so that there wouldn't be random students, you know, on their skateboards just rolling by. Right. Um, so, so uh, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was quite a, quite a interesting effort that I had done, hadn't, you know, done before. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yes, I, that was something a few years back. Yeah. That's a very unique experience. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, all right. So, as I mentioned, you know, American Sutra, uh, you know, focuses on the, the history of, you know, Japanese American Buddhists during World War II. And, you know, I, I as I read in the intro and I've, I've seen talks that you've given, you know, discussing how this book came about. Um, and it's a, just a really interesting story that, that goes back to your, your professor, your mentor. But could you explain kind of what led you to write this book, to do this research, which ended up taking you like 17 years, right? That's right. You know, like uh, I, I was a scholar of Japan and Japanese mm -hmm. Buddhism, and that was my main area. So I never thought I'd write a whole book on Japanese American Buddhism during World War II. Like that was not an area I was trained on. Mm -hmm. uh, but my professor, my mentor passed away just after I finished writing my doctoral dissertation. And in the course of helping his family, you know, handle 
his books and letter, like personal effects in, in mm-hmm. his office. I came across a diary from World War II from one of these uh, camps that 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry were sent to. And it was his dad's diary. And his, his dad was a Buddhist priest that mm-hmm. had served in San Francisco before the war. And he was in this place called Manzanar. I had just a little bit of my own ignorance. I, you know, I grew up in Japan mm-hmm. until I was 17 years old. And I didn't learn in Japan very much about the treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II and how they were put in camp or how people in Hawaii were under martial law and all this. Kind of, so I didn't know any of that. Mm-hmm. So when I was trying to make heads and tails of what this diary by this Buddhist priest in one of these camps surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards was all about, and I was trying to translate it from Japanese into English for the, as a, out of respect for my professor and for, you know, to, to have uh, something for his family. Yeah. Um, uh, that's when I first kind of learned about what happened during World War II Japanese Americans. But then as time went on, I went on to interview about a hundred some 20 people, uh, camp survivors and uh, World War II veterans. And uh, I went on to translate more diaries um, uh, and letters and correspond, you know, things like that. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and that became the basis for the book that came out last year. Mm. Yeah, like I, I remember you telling the story of um, uh, Professor Nagatomi's wife, right? Right, uh, right. Uh, uh, the Kimura family, right? And when, when they were um, right after, uh, was it FBI agents went to their house, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I think when when I was translating the diary, I was giving the translated bits to my professors now, you mm-hmm. know, the widowed wife. Um, she told me her family story, which is the Kimura family in Madera, mm-hmm. California. They, you know, ran a farmhouse. They originally came from Wakayama Prefecture. And one day she comes home from school. She's only like 10, 11 years old. Mm-hmm. And there's these people beating up her dad. So mm-hmm. she's really scared of what's going on. And she looks into the farmhouse. And a man has got a shotgun trained to her mother's head at the kitchen mm-hmm. table. And she knew that she being the only bilingual one in the family, even though she was so young, she had to step in. So she did and it became clear in the translation uh, that these are FBI agents. They're mm-hmm. there because her dad was uh, an official at the local Buddhist association. Mm-hmm. And that put him on some kind of FBI watch list. Um, and that, um, uh, there was this whole process of like them interrogating them. And um, he didn't get picked up that day. They would come back several more times mm-hmm. uh, because he wasn't a Buddhist priest. Most Buddhist priests were on a category of persons to be picked up. Somehow, maybe it's kind of like Islam today, mm-hmm. where mosques and imams are considered potentially like a threat or something to American national security. Mm -hmm. That was the situation with Buddhist priests at that time in American history. Mm -hmm. And so he was on this list because he was on the, you know, high ranking member of the, of the Buddhist temple. Mm -hmm. And basically what happened, uh, you know, to that family was typical of many families. They they had to sell their farm for one twentieth of the market value. They had to go to these camps. And when they came back, they couldn't buy it back. And in the meantime, they had, you know, try to sell everything they could, but he couldn't. And they had to try to to prove their loyalty to America. They burnt everything that had made in Japan or kanji on it. Mm -hmm. And he kind of couldn't get himself to burn uh, these documents uh, from the temple and also a sutra, like a Mm -hmm. Buddhist scripture that had been handed down in his family. Mm -hmm. So he buries it. And for his daughter, it was like so shocking because like he had burnt his her, you know, dolls, like Hinamatsuri Ningyo and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so um, she was like, why aren't you burning these things? And he and he tried to explain to her, just because we're Buddhist doesn't mean that we're, you know, un-American or anti-American, like we're some kind of threat to America. Mm-hmm. So that became a big theme in my book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, ever since she's told me that story, it's always been the kind of like, oh, these are stories of people for whom maybe they might have wanted to erase something about their Japanese heritage so that they could somehow prove that they belonged in America at a time when the media, the uh, intelligence agencies, uh, their neighbors even thought they were, you know, uh, like not welcome. 
mm-hmm. uh, and, and even worse, should be put in these camps. And in that moment, they kind of turned to their faith, you know, their Buddhist faith. Majority of the Japanese American community back then was Buddhist. And so they turned to their faith to kind of like give them some, you know, anchor and stability and orientation on how to deal with this really, you know, uh, disruptive situation of, of, of being suddenly removed from their homes, taken to these camps for a time indefinite. People didn't know how long they're going, where they're going. Um, and then they've ha- having to sell their uh, business, their farms. If you're a student in college, having to disenroll, even if you're like just a, one or two credits away from graduating. So everybody's life was su- super disrupted mm-hmm. and uh, people f- turned to their faith. And then these families were saying, you know what? I can be both American and Buddhist at the same time. So that's the kind of main theme of the book. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's so many little things like throughout the book that, that stood out to me. But um, for example, there's this one uh, incident that you tell of a temple in Salinas, California, mm. that they had a gong. And then I think it was like a local uh, official approaches the priest and says, oh, we want you to take down the gong because it could be used as a signal for Japanese ships coming into the, the harbor or whatever. But it's like many, many miles away from, right. the, from the ocean. So it's not like, one, the ships wouldn't be able to hear the gong. And two, right. it's like, how do you even signal someone with the gong? It's like these things that don't even make sense, right? right. The, you know, so that's well, when, when people in the government Post-war, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, and there's a commission to determine why did this group of 120,000 people, uh, you know, two-thirds of them American U.S. citizens, um, usually before you get sent to a prison with guards and barbed wire and whatever, you've got to have committed some kind of crime, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and there's the constitutional guarantee of due process and things like that, and so the commission found that it was a lack of political leadership and racism of that time, but also war hysteria of the Mm -hmm. kind that you mentioned. This Mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, they had false sightings of planes that were attacking LA or, you know, this police chief um, uh, telling them to bring down this temple gong that, uh, you know, the priest remembers could only be heard maybe on a good day with the wind going the right way a couple blocks down the street, let alone 19 miles away, you know, by some, I don't know, using some Morse code to mm-hmm. send signals right. or something. Yeah. So, so it was this kind of like um, uh, very unreasoned mm-hmm. uh, kind of uh, thing that happened immediately after Pearl Harbor and in the months and years that followed. Yeah. Um, you know, another interesting aspect that I saw was like the, I mean, I I guess this fluctuated throughout the war years, but there were times when uh, people like Japanese Americans that were Christians were kind of looked as more favorably, more quote unquote American and kind of treated a little bit different from the Buddhist Japanese Americans. And then that would lead to like tensions with, within the group and outside the groups. And it's so just, like it's frustrating on one level, right? It's like, <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, so, you know, inclusion and exclusion in American history has always been either on the axis of race or the axis of religion. So sometimes it's like a Muslim bank takes a place or sometimes it's about um, the Southern border, you know, today. So, so race and religion has often been one of the two axes. So sometimes even in some cases conflated and combined. And so uh, in the case of Japanese Americans, there was this kind of notion that if you're a Japanese American Christian, which would have been made you a, you know, a minority religiously in the community at that time, Mm -hmm. but there were a good number of, you know, Christians, um, maybe 20% among the second generation, uh, for example. So, uh, you know, they had just a very different treatment. For example, in Salinas, where you mentioned that thing about the Temple of Gong, Mm -hmm. the Christian priest in that same town was uh, working together with the police commissioner and with the mayor and so on. So, so somehow Christians were treated differently than Buddhists. And when they went into camp, one of the most um, clear ways that religious difference kind of manifested mm-hmm. was when, you know, when you go to prison, you have to kind of like 
they look for contraband, anything that, you know, like any weapon or, mm. you know, uh, something that, you know, in this case, like, like if you had a camera because somehow they suspected you of espionage, you know, right. so they would confiscate contraband. And so one of the things people found out as soon as it got to these camps was that if you had anything written in Japanese, if you had kanji in printed matter, mm-hmm. that was considered contraband. Mm. And so if you had a Buddhist sutra, that was contraband. If you had a, uh, you know, even like a book of Japanese haiku or something, that was contraband poetry. And, but the only two exceptions were if you had an English Japanese language dictionary mm-hmm. and if you had a Christian Bible in Japanese, mm. that was okay. Mm-hmm. And so what was the message people were receiving? They were being kind of told that to belong in America, there's this kind of, let's call it Anglo-Protestant normativity. Mm-hmm. Some kind of Anglo both being this sense of racial whiteness, but also English only. And then this idea of if you're Christian, you can kind of belong better, that mm-hmm. kind of idea. So, so I think that's what people faced, you know, this kind of uh, basic messaging that um, uh, what is permissible uh, would be if you learned English, and if you became Christian, if you're not already. Um, but uh, so, something outside of that was either un-American or even worse, anti-American. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's the kind of um, situation people face. And to, just to give you one more example, in 1943, they had this thing called the loyalty questionnaire. It's a famous uh, thing where people, if they answered wrong on these particular two questions, question 27, 28, about whether they would be willing to serve in the U.S. military and whether they would renounce any kind of allegiance or whatever to the emperor of Japan. If they answered yes or no on, if they answered no on either one, they were sent to a special segregation camp for what they considered disloyals. Mm -hmm. But also in that question, there was a question about religion. And if you answered that you were Christian, you got plus points like plus two points mm-hmm. if you answered shinto you got like you were totally banned from any kind of potential release out of the camp mm-hmm. and if you answered buddhist you got minus one point in, in other words like the government had even during the camp days these kind of like assessments of loyalty based on religious affiliation mm-hmm. and so this is the kind of like context that people who are majority buddhists were facing and yet they retain their links to their Buddhist uh, traditions mm-hmm. uh, in camp. And so that, that was always, to me, a fascinating story of when all the pressure's on you to, to, to not be that, why be that? And, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of the book kind of tries to go into uh, why people found that particular faith tradition um, helpful for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you tell many, you give many, like, examples of how they kept their faith and and still practice their faith through like um you, you, i remember the uh juzu beads that were mm. made from peach pits right 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 yeah just trying to find different ways to yeah. adapt to the situation basically exactly so you know if you can imagine if you've got a week or 10 days to take you know, you've got to sell your business or get a disenroll from school or you have to search your apartment or house to be like, okay, they say I can take what I can carry. So that's a suitcase usually, mm-hmm. right? So you're like, okay, when I get out of here, I'm going to a place unknown for a time indefinite. What am I going to put in the suitcase? That's when most people forget their ojuzu or kind of like Buddhist beads or, yeah. t- you know, their butsudan or Buddhist altar, home altars and stuff yeah. like that. So that once they're in camp, they, they, as you, the example you gave about mm. keeping the peach pits um, enough to make a little bead, um, uh, a string of beads, or mm. uh, you, keep, you know, finding scrap uh, mess hall kind of crate, wooden crates, or uh, desert wood, or whatever mm. to make those Buddhist altars. Uh, that kind of handcrafting and reviving of faith life in camp through whatever means they could, you know, whatever. Uh, they could find around them. That was also a very, I feel like another lesson from that period of like, how do you, how do you recreate faith at a time when, you know, you've experienced all this loss and despair? How do you find any kind of liberation or freedom uh, 
when all your freedoms have been taken away from you. Mm. It's, it's a, to me, a kind of like a really interesting story about um, uh, people's ingenuity, you know, when it comes to, to trying to survive and persist. Mm, yeah. So something that I couldn't help but think as I was reading the book is like, what long lasting, long-term impact did this uh, period in history have on Buddhism in the U S especially, I mean, I, I guess more recently now Buddhism has become a thing that's not just, you know, the Japanese do Buddhism. Now it's a more right. widespread thing, but like, for example, I, I studied, you know, religious studies in an undergrad. I I've lived in Japan. I've, I've had an interest in, in, you know, Buddhism and going visiting right. temples and seeing how things are over there. And then when I moved to Hawaii, because I was in Florida before, right. like, and I started, you know, uh, learning about the culture here and, and visiting the temples and interviewing people like it, it felt a little bit different in the way people were practicing right like right. um they meet on sundays and think things right. like that that you don't normally see in japan it, do things like that date back to world war ii or were those kinds of things already going on so in general in when we study something like buddhism which has a mm -hmm. you know really long 2500 year history and mm -hmm. goes from india to uh, china to tibet and from china and korea to japan and every time it moves there's a process of acculturation that happens mm -hmm. right where on the one hand it brings something new to the religious landscape and you know what's available and uh, that's always the case but on the other hand it also adapts to its local situation and mm -hmm. so for example when buddhism went to japan a lot of what the pre-existing shinto kind of culture there uh combined with buddhism and and a lot of temple shrine complexes began to develop and uh, there are many things that um, are different also about chinese buddhism where they combine it with confucianism and taoism and that's why you have like obon you know like uh mm -hmm. and kind of respect for ancestors that's not something they had in original indian buddhism mm. but something that got changed when it moved to china so there's right. always going to be that process of acculturation so when japanese buddhism went to hawaiian islands or to the mainland us or canada or whatever mm -hmm. it's going to have some forms of change and that change takes time and so some of that was happening even before the war where mm. for example what you mentioned mm -hmm. congregationalism Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of meeting on a particular day to congregate at a temple and to make it mm -hmm. a Sunday so mm -hmm. as to kind of match up with kind of the dominant culture. Obviously, mm -hmm. Jews tended to meet on Saturdays and Muslims on Fridays and then Christians on Sunday. And I think probably the Buddhists just decided, okay, we'll mimic the Christians because they seem yeah. more dominant in society or whatever. So, so that kind of congregationalism is an important shift an acculturation as it were but things like also like calling the temples like churches as opposed yeah. to temples yeah, I or that, yeah. calling the buddhist priests ministers and mm -hmm. whatnot so these kind of subtle shifts and sometimes you find in some temples in hawaii as well as on the mainland you find like pews even you know mm -hmm. so yeah. it looks yeah, yeah, yeah. architecturally even if the outside may look japanese mm -hmm. Inside, there's like a organ and pews, and uh, they began doing things like they call it sambutsuka. It's mm -hmm. like sambika in Japanese means like Christian like hymns, but mm -hmm. sambutsuka means like Buddhist hymns mm -hmm. and putting Buddhist kind of like songs to Western right. like music using the organ and kind of singing in choirs and stuff like that. So some of that began even before the war. Mm -hmm. But once World War II came around, the pressure was on, right, to yeah. acculturate. And so it, I would say it accelerated that process of acculturation by mm -hmm. like 20-fold. Yeah. And so that's the impact of World War II under mm -hmm. martial law in Hawaii and with the camps in the mainland is, mm -hmm. is, is that that acculturation process sped up really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so some of these shifts probably acculturated more than the addition idea like right. usually there's a balance between you know buddhism brings something new in terms of thinking as, as uh, kind of like festivals and practices but also kind of how you live together in community some different ethics and what, whatnot it's always been the case that they bring some new things but and always the case that they acculturate but mm -hmm. i think that world war ii 
experience was one where the culturation acceleration happened yeah. uh, uh, very quickly. So um, it, 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 it was, I would say, it got off a little balance there. Mm. Um, so there, there's two more areas I want to ask you about. One is... Uh, you, you highlight a lot of people and history um, in Hawaii. Um, of course, not surprisingly, there's a very large Japanese American yeah. community here. Um, I, I guess, uh, have you visited? You must have done some interviews or maybe over the phone. What was that research process like? Sure. I, th I think probably for the book, I visited mm -hmm. the Juan Islands maybe about 20 times wow. uh, in different trips. I, yeah. As I mentioned, it took me about 17 years. Sure. So I would do multiple trips a year to mm -hmm. look at the archives, uh, to interview people. Uh, you know, one of the people that uh, 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 Yoshiaki uh, Fujitani, who features in my book uh, mm -hmm. towards the latter half, half he, his dad is um, uh, one of the Buddhist priests arrested in Hawaii, mm -hmm. but he himself it joins this victory varsity volunteers, which oh, becomes yeah. the the basis of the 100th battalion and the 442nd regimental combat team. So it's this interesting story about this Japanese American young Buddhist, you know, person who later in his life became a Buddhist priest. And in fact, the Bishop of the Hopahongaj in Hawaii, but mm -hmm. he's, you know, 96 years old now. And, uh, uh, it was people like him that I would go to interview. Mm -hmm. uh, but I interviewed dozens of individuals, uh, archives on all the main islands, uh, including, of course, the big ones like JCCH in Honolulu, uh, but the different archives also at the University of Hawaii Manoa. So, um, uh, you know, this book was based on also families sharing mm -hmm. letters and uh, memoirs and things that were written in Japanese. Um, so, yes, uh, it, it was, it was, um, it was, it uh, 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 a very, I don't know, uh, immersive process sure, to try, yeah. try to um, also gain the trust of people to mm -hmm. to want to share some of those stories and and share some of those diaries and memoirs and whatnot, uh, photographs. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it, it was it was a, a, a extensive process because I didn't want to just tell the mainland camp story, which mm -hmm. is what sometimes happens with World War II. There mm -hmm. were camps in Hawaii, like Sand Island and Honolulu. Yeah. Uh, but mm -hmm. also, you know, what happened un under martial law and how Buddhism fared under that. That's not a story that's often told. And same with the military stuff. Everyone might talk about the 442, but they don't talk about the 100th Battalion so much, or about these group of Nisei in Hawaii that uh, actually formed the backbone of the first group that went to serve in Europe, called yeah. the Purple Heart Battalion. They don't talk as much about those you know, 6,000 Nisei who served in the Pacific as translators and prisoner interrogators and code breakers uh, in the Pacific that shortened the war by two years. Most of them were from Hawaii. So I wanted to make sure the Hawaii part of the story entered the island story, the mainland camp story, as well as the military part of the story, mm -hmm. so that when we, when we do the full arc of what happened in Japanese America during World War II, uh, mm -hmm. we, we would also include Hawaii. Yeah, there, there's just so many stories that you highlight, like letters of soldiers, you know, writing to their right. families and mentioning specifically, you know, Buddha and the stories right. of the Buddha. And, and they're just, you know, like these heartbreaking stories. Like um, one story that we actually covered in Wasabi was related to the Empuku brothers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ralph, you mentioned Ralph Empuku. Ralph Empuku, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that story, when I learned about it, you know, a couple of years ago, and we eventually did a story on it, that was just amazing. We had interviewed um, his younger brother. I think it's the youngest brother, right. Um, Paul. Right. Uh, and he, he had not been old enough to serve in the war, but Ralph right. was in the Pacific. Like, he was right. doing, like, guerrilla fighting, like, in, in right. the South Islands, right? So That's right. Yeah. And his dad was a Buddhist priest as well. Yes, yes. And yeah. his story, he, he would yeah. go, he came to, I think, originally Hawaii Island. And he was right. going like, basically like a wandering priest, like setting up yeah. temples. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. So there's just a lot of fascinating stories about people who, uh, from Hawaii, you know, in part, they served in the Pacific because, you know, Hawaii had a lot of temples with Japanese language schools. And there's that mm -hmm. famous U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, uh, Tokuna, uh, Tokushige versus Farrington, uh, which was about the territorial government trying to shut down mm -hmm. these 
Japanese language schools at the Buddhist temples because of that Anglo-Protestant normativity I mentioned earlier. They were like, if you want to be American, you got to be, you know, English only. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they fought for that and they won through the Ninth Circuit and eventually U.S. Supreme Court to ma maintain those temples uh, running these Japanese language schools. Mm -hmm. And it turned out, ironically, that those bilingual kids were the ones who could do that kind of right. work in the Pacific to actually help the American cause. Yeah, yeah, like the the Kibe, right? Like especially That's, the ones right. that were educated in Japan but then came back because they had that right. cultural background as well. That's and right. Like you point out one example of like they find, I think they find some document on a fallen um, imperial Japanese soldier, right. but because it had all this kind of like military type language, right. a lot of them couldn't read it. But the one guy, the Kibe that had been educated right. in like, schools in japan where, which had this kind of military aspect to them at the time could actually read it and led to like you know very valuable information right that's right that's right so whether it's code breaking or prisoner interrogation or translating some of that hegel or military japanese mm -hmm. language uh, of the time uh, uh it was the kibe and those who went to the japanese language schools that uh, were uh you know 99 percent buddhist uh that 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 group were really you know, just a uh, critical for shortening the war, according to the U.S. military's own calculations, saved a million lives and shortened the war by two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, one one last little thing here in the military uh, yeah. side of the story that I wanted to mention that I, I had no idea about, but I I found it very interesting in a rather sad kind of way. But yeah. um, the dog tags, right? Yeah. How you couldn't. Like uh, I, I didn't. I don't know much about dog tags. I, I learned about dog tags in general from this book how it works. But you, right. if you're Christian, you get a, a C, right? Uh, uh, but you know the Buddhists couldn't get a B. So many of them ended up being Mongolian Protestants, right? Right, right. So you know, uh, in terms of race, yeah. uh, they didn't call. You know, back in the day, they would be called Asian people, Orientals, or Mongolians, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then for religion. You could get a C for Catholic, P for Protestant, uh -huh. an H for Hebrew, mm -hmm. and an X for you know, kind of like nothing mm -hmm. uh, or other. And and um, so there was a campaign both in Hawaii and in the camps in the from the mainland, where families of all these young men who were serving in the military, many of them Buddhists, they were like, you know, we should have the ability to, for them to be if they die in battle, have the correct kind of rights, last rights for them mm -hmm. and, and be buried accordingly and, and so forth. And so they need to have the right letter, you know, noting their religious affiliation on, the, on their dog tag. That was the purpose of dog tag. It's like your identity number, your blood type and religion for the right, last rights. Mm -hmm. And so they had this thing called the B for Buddhism campaign, mm -hmm. which ultimately only ended up being successful right after the war, after mm -hmm. all these war heroes came back to Hawaii and so forth. But then uh, uh, there's this one interview I did. Um, it was, it's this funny thing of like um, somebody talking about how they went to the induction mm -hmm. uh, kind of officer and was told that, you know, when he said, you know, I, I, what religion? And he said, I'm Buddhist. And he was told, we don't, son, we don't have Buddhists in the U.S. Army. And so he was like, you got to pick one of the, you know, you know Protestant Catholic. Or, and so he said, I, I, okay, I guess I, I'll, I'll pick P. And the, and the officer was like, so why did you pick Protestant? Because, and then he said, because I protest, you know, <laughs> and, and he got assigned to latrine duty or something. But, <laughs> but anyway, it, it, so sometimes they made these uh, humorous, reflections on yeah. you know, their service in the military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was really interesting. Um, and there's just so much more in the book. It, it's just an eye-opening, fascinating book. Like, you know, I, during my time at Wasabi, you know, I've learned a lot about this, but mm -hmm. never quite from this, you know, one aspect, you know, like right. I touch on it, I kind of go back mm -hmm. and forth, but this through line of Buddhism throughout the whole time and then after the war coming right. back, just... Right. Fascinating. So much there. I highly recommend right. that people check out the book, American Sutra. I will put a link in the um, show notes, in the description and all that. But um, one, one last thing I want to ask you about. Yeah. 
um, you recently published an article, I believe, uh, about right. you becoming a citizen. And this was in June of 2020. We're in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. Right. Like, how does that work? Like, how, how was how was it like going to, you know, because you have to get sworn in and there's a big ceremony and all that. How does that That's work right. these days? So usually, you know, I, 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 back in March, I was scheduled to go to the LA Convention Center. Mm-hmm. And usually, typically, there's thousands of new you know, naturalizing citizens who take an oath in front of a federal judge together. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the normal way it's done. But of course, that was the very day, my thing was the very day when uh, the Governor Newsom, the Governor of California, kind of issued the sh- sh- you know, lockdown order. So right. uh, that, that event was canceled. And then I never, I didn't know if it was ever going to be possible to, to go through with it and do that final step to become a U.S. citizen. Mm-hmm. I've been in this country for 33 years now when I moved mm-hmm. uh, when I was 17 from Japan. Um, and uh, so it's been this long journey to get to the point where, I, you know, but I got, I got this letter from the Homeland Security. I can go to the federal building in LA and mm-hmm. you, you keep the social distance and, you know, whatever. And then behind plexiglass, you, I was able to do this ceremony oh. after all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was a, for me, the, 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 the reason I wrote the article was less mm-hmm. about, the kind of odd circumstance of pandemic uh, Mm -hmm. ceremony, but because it happened on June 19th, which is Juneteenth, you know, and especially this year with the whole kind of like police brutality and anti-blackness and uh, different kinds of things happening um, around the country. It was a particular kind of Juneteenth where Mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, remembrance about the kind of legacies of slavery and, and, and what that meant and, and so I wrote this essay about, like, it was, I called it the karma of becoming American, but the mm. kind of like l- karmic legacy that we inherit when we become new citizens mm. is that we kind of had to embrace both the good and the bad of America, you know, all at once. Sure. Uh, and, 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 but also to kind of remember um, people from history who have also experienced this kind of delay of, you know, uh, Juneteenth is about the story of, you know, Abraham Lincoln issues an Emancipation Proclamation, but it doesn't, it takes two and a half extra years to get to Galveston, Texas, uh, all the way out there uh, from Washington, D.C. And, mm-hmm. and it's a story about kind of freedom delayed. And, and, and that's, you know, an aspiration of America about freedom, this whole World War II thing about whether it's due process, like there's this long history of mm-hmm inclusion and exclusion based on race, sometimes on religion. And um, when you become a new American, you have to kind of like adopt all of that and say, what's my role? What's my place in this whole lineage of what's come before me? And so anyway, that's, that's, uh, uh, I don't want to belabor this uh, essay, but it, it's a, mm-hmm. it's something I reflection I wrote about kind of like, what is what does it mean to have become American on that day? What does it mean to have become American in this kind of environment that we're in politically, yeah. uh, socially, religiously? That was very interesting. Is it um, up online now? Yeah. So uh, there's uh, uh, one version of it that mm. uh, an organization called Densho, which is the mm. large Japanese American organization mm-hmm. in based in Seattle, they put put it up on their website and a different version is uh, coming out imminently from tricycle magazine which is a buddhist national buddhist magazine based out of new york okay. uh, so yeah it's it's coming on two two uh two different uh arenas gotcha okay so then i can put the link in the description as well so people can take a look at it so uh again dr williams thank you so much um like i said the All book right. i really interesting people can should definitely go check it out. Um, I think especially for people here in Hawaii too, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of really uh, interesting stuff that that is worth learning about and, and really thinking about, I think. So uh, American Sutra, that's what it's called, Dr. Williams. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate taking the time talking to you today. Yeah.